So hello everyone. Welcome to the third conversation of our speaker series. My name is Bao Ling, one of the organizers for the competition, a graduate from the Yale School of Architecture. And here with me are two other organizers. Hello, my name is Megan. Hi, I'm Jordan. So as mentioned before in our previous um, chats, the objective of this speaker series is to first of all, increase transparency of the competition process to introduce our jurors. And more important is in looking at our competition topic and also to help our potential participants in formulating their design ideas. And throughout our session, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat. We'll pick a few for the Q&A session at the end of the conversation. And now we would like to officially welcome our speakers for today. We are really honored to have here today, Dr. Roger Wong, Executive Associate Dean of Postgraduate Medicine, Medical Education, also a clinical professor at the Geriatrics at the Department of Medicine at University of British Columbia. He was also president of the Canadian Geriatrics Society. And also we have Professor David Allison here, Director of Graduate Studies in Architecture and Health, Alumni Distinguished Professor of Architecture at Clemson University. He's also a founding member of the American College of Healthcare Architects. And in the year 09, one zero and one two, he was um, identified in a national poll conducted by the magazine as one of the most influential people in healthcare design. So we are really, really honored to have them here today. And I'm going to start by asking them to briefly introduce themselves again to our audience. Um, Dr. Wong, thank you for being here. Can you just briefly introduce yourself and your area of expertise, maybe in health? Absolutely. Good day, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Roger Wong, and uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm delighted to be joining uh, the live chat today. I'm a geriatric specialist doctor, so I look after seniors, and in particular, my track record has been looking after seniors uh, when they get uh, really unwell, they require hospital admission. So providing specialized care in acute care for elders units. Um, we will be talking a lot about the intersect between design and health. And that is one example. I started that uh, more than two decades ago. And um, some of the other work that I've been doing in particular um, and trying to really protect and support seniors wherever they live, whether it is in a community, in a long-term care home setting, something that we have heard a lot about during the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, and as well as uh, other aspects, such as the importance of balancing the mental health with physical health, which again, we'll come back to. I'm also a clinical professor in the Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. And my academic role there, I'm the Vice Dean for Education, so I am the uh, most senior um, chief academic officer, basically, in the medical school at UBC here in Vancouver, Canada. So really delighted to be sharing with you today. And I'm sure our conversations will be exciting, will be stimulating, and most importantly, I hope will generate new ideas to help our participants or prospective participants in this very interesting competition. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Wong. And David, would you mind briefly introducing yourself as well and sure. your area of expertise? My name is David Allison. Uh, as, as stated, I'm an alumni distinguished professor at Clemson University in South Carolina uh, in the United States. Uh, I'm also the director of a graduate program in architecture and health. It's one of the few in the United States and globally, uh, and we're one of the two oldest programs uh, uh, in a, that we still are still in existence. So the program was founded in 1968 
Uh, and um, I'm also a registered architect, uh, and I'm a board certified healthcare architect with the American College of Healthcare Architecture. So it's one of the few uh, uh, specialty board certification. In fact, it's the only board certification area in architecture for specialization in practice. I've been teaching at Clemson since 1990, uh, so I'm going into my 31st year uh, as, as an educator and director of this program. Uh, and um, my, er actually my graduate work was in uh, long-term care uh, settings, uh, but uh, since then I've been, pra I practiced in healthcare architecture uh, in San Francisco and in Charleston, South Carolina before uh, coming back uh, and into academia. And this is now my primary job. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I'm interested in the study of, of architecture and health, architecture broadly defined. I'm everything from urban settings and urban design down to industrial design. So cities, buildings, spaces and elements uh, of the built environment that influence uh, health. Uh, and, um, and we take a very broad definition of what is a healthcare environment uh, because we think all settings are, are, are healthcare environments or, or should be designed to support our health and well-being. Okay. And I look forward to having this conversation and thank you. It sounds like a very interesting uh, competition and I applaud the uh, organizers for uh, setting it up. Right. So thank you. Thank you very much, David. So maybe we just proceed to our questions. So our first question would be, um, you have looked at our list of keywords we have put in the competition brief. And again, would you mind sharing the screen? So this is the list of keywords we have um, on the competition website and is part of brief. So on the left, you see uh, a list of um, keywords of words for physical infrastructures. So from objects like wearables, clothes, electronic devices to basically um, large public spaces that includes public plazas, sidewalks, green spaces. And on the right, we have a list of possible health or activities that is related directly or indirectly to health. So by just so the the requirement for the competition is that we choose one keyword from the left, the infrastructure, to pair with one of the keywords on the right, the health activities. And by pairing them, we're supposed to kind of like cross-pollinate to form something that you to, to basically to that will be the design brief for your design. So how this two things that might be different can uh, connect together and generate something new or something that is existing. So my question will be like, by looking at this list, um, which pair would you be most interested in? Or would you actually be most interested to see a design for? So, um, Anyone can start. Me. You want to uh, start, Dr. Wong? Absolutely. Delighted to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, let me start by saying that I, I think one of the pieces that impressed me the most about this competition is the innovation. So while I'm going to provide with you one example in a moment in terms of the pairing, I really want to preface this by saying um, you know, the sky is the limit. So I really encourage people not to be bound necessarily by these things. But I think uh, when I look at these um, different um, pairing, uh, one of the pieces that really intrigue me will be, um, I'm going to start off, you know, as, as a physician, I'm going to start off on the health activity side. So I, I look at exercising and I really think exercising is something which is very close and dear to my heart. And I think uh, for all ages, but in particular in my clinical practice, for seniors and older adults, exercising we know is uh, really important both for physical health and for mental health. And in particular in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. Then when I look at the physical infrastructure on the other side, 
I, I'm trying to think, you know, what, what are some of the things that really um, will be a little bit less expected? And I'm going to pick shopping malls. And you might say, why, why on earth would I pick shopping malls as exercise? Well, the reality is, and again, we have to remember the nature of this competition is what I would describe in general as disruptive innovation. I think COVID-19 is probably the biggest disruption that we have seen in the past 100 years. And therefore, as a result of the disruption, how can we as humans and as well as societies and communities make adaptations? And I think these adaptations hopefully will be innovative. So I would say because of the result of protecting people with physical distancing, a lot of times people really cannot go to a lot of different places where they used to exercise, whether it is like, for example, working out in a gym, et cetera. So we need to start beyond, thinking beyond the, the, the limits. And I think while in the past, very few people might think about kind of shopping malls and doing things outside of business activities, I think if you can think about how do we repurpose spaces that we have to make them user-friendly enough so that we can do health activities that are beneficial, both to the body and the mind. And therefore, I would start picking off, for example, shopping malls and exercise as an example. Right, yeah. And I think, yeah, shopping malls, I mean, has, I, I think has different, a lot of different meanings in different contexts. So I guess um, from where I am right now, maybe in Singapore and some of the Asian contexts, like shopping malls almost become um, centrals of social activities, like where, where people kind of like socialize and mingle, maybe a bit, a lot more than like, almost taking like the, the kind of like, like public parks, the role of public parks that happens in all of like the Western countries. So yeah, it might be something that is very interesting to look at as a typology that can help to provide health activities. Yeah. And, and and I would add, if I may very quickly, I right. think again, you know, within the context of the global pandemic right now, and it looks like it's not going away very soon, how do we think about designing spaces, say within a shopping mall or whatever, that can be safe? And I think that physical space and that allow for physical distancing so that activities can resume and continue in a safe way uh, is something that I certainly would be very interested in hearing about. Thank you, Dr. Wong. And David? Well, and um, just to build on Dr. Wong's thing, in the United States, and I don't know whether this is a worldwide trend or not, but we have what we call a lot of dead or dying malls, mm -hmm. uh, shopping right. malls, because the, the mode of shopping is changing uh, to online shopping a lot. Uh, you know, of course, COVID and the pandemic has, has increased that. So finding ways to uh, adapt and convert even shopping malls into new purposes is, I think, an important, um, important thing. Now, from my standpoint, you know, of course, we think healthcare environments are every kind of environment and that help treat care treatment and and promotion and prevention activities uh should be done everywhere you know we argue for a, the notion that and i think we're going to be moving more and more towards this the kind of ubiquitous kind of health care or ubiquitous access to health resources uh and um, everything from wearables down to the places uh, that we exist in, in our cities and communities and our homes. Uh, but I, I chose um, uh, institutions, in particular schools, um, uh, as, as the setting um, that I wanted to kind of focus on for, for uh, medical examination. Now, again, schools may be different in the United States than in other parts of the world, but they're one of the most underutilized physical assets uh, that we have in our communities uh, because in the U.S. students typically go to school for nine months out of the year, five days a week, eight hours a day. So you have this infrastructure that exists that's highly underutilized for a significant amount of time uh, over the course of a year. 
and so one of the things that we explored several years back was that particularly primary schools, which are often located close to where people live, uh, that those should become more like community centers for learning and well-being, that they might have a, a variety of resources available that are walkable, uh, accessible, uh, and, um, and, you know, particularly for health care, uh, primary health care, health promotion, health prevention, uh, uh, you know, everything from periodic you've got blood donation on the on the health activity side, but screenings, uh, places for immunizations, um, uh, you know, vaccinations, as, as you said, they're probably not a place for quarantining um, in, in, a, in a time like COVID. Uh, but, but in terms of trying to make healthcare accessible uh, and, and to, to take advantage of a resource in multiple ways and get more out of the physical investment in a place uh, for a variety of purposes. Of course, we think education is a health health supporting activity as well, uh, and that but the school could be a place for um, you know every school should have a school nurse. Uh, and, you know, most families that are raising children, the 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 primary school is a center of 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 life for those families. They're often on grounds where there's uh, you know, playgrounds, uh, recreational facilities, ball fields, uh, uh, you know, park-like settings. And, and so we think the school ground should be a resource that is used around the clock, uh, uh, seven days a week, uh, and as a place for potentially primary health care, health promotion, health prevention, uh, uh, activities. Uh, and, and so that's one of the reasons I chose those two. Uh, but, but the idea that we're trying to say, you know, argue for is that healthcare should be accessible wherever you are, as close to where you are, uh, all the time. Uh, and, uh, and health promotion should be something that's incentivized by making it easy to, to do, uh, you know, um, the challenge, I think, you know, in coming back to, to shopping malls in the United States, and I know they're different in places that are highly urbanized and, and dense, but they're go-to places as opposed to pass-through places. And so what we're trying to promote is the idea that, that health promotion and health uh, care delivery, particularly primary care and, and prevention, should be central to the 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 life space of, of as many human beings as possible. Uh, so, um, but I do think that as a resource, uh, uh, shopping malls uh, would be a, a good place to, to expand the, the role that they play, particularly when they're in urban places or accessible to public transportation. Right. So I guess, um, when I hear both of you speaking, it sounds like um, both of you are like pointing to an idea of healthcare that it's somehow not traditional, not like the traditional definition of like happening within um, a constructed specialized healthcare area of facilities that's somehow trying to kind of like expand itself and like blur its boundaries, like um, with those kind of like just formalized infrastructure and somehow blending itself into the, the, the urban realms, into everyone's like home. So, yep. So if I may chime in as well, I think what um, David has touched on is a really important point. When we look at health, we look at a more holistic way of defining health. So health does not only refer to the provision of care or what we call healthcare, which is a service and activity. And, and David used the word health promotion, mm -hmm. and I totally agree. What we're promoting is not only the biomedical sphere of health, but there are multiple domains and spheres. So if you look at the World Health Organization of Health, it is very inclusive. It includes things such as accommodation, I'm talking about housing, include things such as accessibility to food, 
it includes a lot of things. It is that holistic view that we're trying to promote. And in that case, in terms of innovation and design, I would encourage all of us really to think in terms of that broad concept of health. It is not necessarily about a particular type of service or a particular kind of interaction per se, but a much more holistic way. For example, one of the things that we have learned and we're still learning for COVID-19 is that there are many social determinants of health that are affecting outcomes in terms of how people are affected. And the social determinants of health um, include a lot of things, but in particular, you know, in terms of their access to food, their access to housing, their uh, school educational level. Um, also, we know that we're starting to learn that there are particular groupings who are more vulnerable because of these social determinants of health. It could be because of demographics. It could be because of the location of where they live, which are surrogate markers of some of these determinants. So I really encourage us to be very holistic in thinking yeah, about this. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, referred to a great Canadian, Trevor Hancock, who uh, I think the World Health Organization adopted his notion of healthy communities, mm -hmm. right? And that, that the healthy community is one that has economic health, nutritional health, you know, defines health very broadly, uh, education, uh, all kinds of social determinants to health. So, so I think we have to move beyond, and we are, I mean, it's, it, we are, we are making that progress. Uh, I mean, move, but move beyond health care and move to health maintenance and promotion and support uh, and care when you need it. But, but that's, I think, you know, your, one of your questions was the misconceptions about health care yes. and that okay. if we only focus on the, on the treatment of the reactive treatment of disease and injury, then we're, we're really, really missing the big picture uh, in terms of addressing the broader health of populations. Thank you. That, that's, yeah, that's something that we actually want to uh, address, like when we were looking into uh, setting up the brief for the competition, because we were thinking like uh, a city has so much resources, so much infrastructures that has utilize a lot of like uh, manpower and also like monetary resources to, to construct and build. But then like what David said, a lot of them were not, not, not only schools, I think a lot of spaces were underutilized maybe to a certain extent because they're designed to be monofunctional, like only for one purpose. So like, yeah, in, in the case of COVID this time, we really have, have witnessed like where some spaces are kind of like forced to um, readapt to change itself because of this kind of external pressure. And maybe after this event, we could possibly um, give us almost the, the light that like, maybe this space should be designed with a multi-purpose in mind beforehand, rather than like them being forced to adapt when uh, a dire situation comes, right? So, so it's, it's something that we, we really have to, I guess, um, maybe think like, what would be like a good, um, like in, in your mind, what would be like a good design, good example of a good design of this kind of spaces that can be a bit uh, multifunctional? Like, or, or more generally, like what are some specific areas of design that you believe that will actually promote uh, better health? So that might have been look, overlooked in the past, like, I don't know, like, um, access to open space or open air or like greenery, for example. Yeah, do you think, what, what do you think are qualities that would help? Well, um, I mean, as, as a so-called healthcare architect, uh, one of the areas that I think can stand to have significant improvement is actually the healthcare campus or medical complexes that we build today. Uh, often, historically, they were built as kind of islands of uh, very sophisticated healthcare treatment. Uh, if, if, uh, many of you have maybe experienced them. They're 
There's almost single use districts that are uh, hard to navigate, hard to find your way around. They're complex, they're intimidating. Um, they're very institutional in character. They're, they're places that, that live only for the delivery of healthcare, but don't live for, to support the communities in which they exist. So, you know, and the, and the interesting thing is a healthcare, um, a hospital, a medical campus, a medical school, um, you know, they're often the, 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 the economic engines of the communities in which they exist. The, the number of people that work in these places, uh, the number of people that engage them on a day-to-day -day basis is incredible. So, you know, one of the things we try to teach in our program is that the, 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 the academic medical center or the healthcare campus should be a model for healthy community planning and design. It should include recreational spaces. It should include mixed uses. It should be vibrant and livable 24 hours of the day. It should provide services for the people that are coming there to receive care, but also for the vast numbers of people that work there. It should provide housing nearby that's walkable for everyone from the housekeeping staff to the to the physicians uh it should uh it should be a place that people want to go to because there's things that are valuable to them and health supporting to them whether or not they're sick or ill uh and they shouldn't be intimidating places they should be centers of the community uh they should have parks i mean there's multiple purposes a park in a healthcare campus is not only a place for the people of the city to come to, it's a therapeutic landscape for people who are actually in the buildings <laughs> to look out onto or to escape to for lunch. Uh, so many of uh, the people who work in healthcare in a large hospital often w go in in the winter time before the sun rises and leave after the sun sets in the afternoon. And to, and to be exposed to nature, be exposed to sunlight, be exposed to health supporting things, uh, you know, while they're, they're, they're on that campus, while they're working, to be able to go out and have lunch in a green space, to be able to, uh, to, be able to have daycare uh, on campus, uh, you know, those kind of things. So, so, you know, one of the things we try to argue is that the hospital or the medical center campus should be a model for healthy community planning design and, and, a, and, and, a, and much more of a center, not the only, but one of the centers of community uh, because they already are, again, they're the places that a lot of people pass through either on a day-to-day -day basis to go to work there or you know, when they're already in need of some kind of support. And from my perspective, I fully agree with David's comment about the feeling of um, trying to get out of the hospital or medical center building. I can only share with you that as a frontline worker, including during COVID, uh, I would love the opportunity to get out and get off my mask and all my equipment so I actually can breathe real fresh air. But on a more serious note, I think the big principle that I look at in answering the question of how do we design spaces as we move forward is we need to think about spaces that promote wellness in terms of health rather than treating diseases, the traditional concept that we understand. I think wellness and diseases are two signs of potentially the same coin but historically, I think so much emphasis has been put, including in designs and, and use of space to really focus on the latter in terms of diseases and management rather than promoting wellness. So I fully agree that spaces that we look at, whether they are in a hospital or in a clinic or in the general community or in a household should focus on talking about and promoting wellness as opposed to fix, figuring out how do we deal with specific disease or long-standing conditions. We know that there are what we call chronic diseases, long-standing health conditions that are very prevalent. And we know that in particular, in the middle of a global pandemic, 
some of these conditions raise their ugly heads, so as to say, because they, are, they predispose people to more easily developing serious health complications. That said, I think it is so important that we use space as an enabler mm -hmm. to promote wellness overall. And I think the big question really is, how do you do that? I encourage us to think beyond spaces. I see that in your original list, you had some items which um, I saw there was an item, you used the term wearables. Mm -hmm. And sorry for me, when I first look at it, I immediately think about wearable electronic devices. Yeah. But you actually, I'm talking about clothing and so on. And then you have another one, which is about electronic devices. Mm -hmm. But I think what I'm trying to say is whether it is a piece of jewelry or a special type of watch or a special kind of bracelet or necklace, how do we bring health into those kind of designs? It's not just about space, but it's about everything else that we encounter in a day-to-day -day living. And I think those are the kind of things that we need to think about. Now, the obvious thing, obviously, many of us are already used to with electronic wearable devices is they actually capture certain measurements, the metrics of health, which are surrogate markers. They, they indirectly reflect kind of health status. But how do we get beyond that? Because surrogate markers do not necessarily point to a particular health status. So when you talk about health status, it goes beyond what a number looks like. What I often talk about is, I care a lot more about the person instead of the number. So I think it is really important that we start thinking in a very broad-based way. Yeah, I, I agree entirely, absolutely. And, and, and that's you know, what we try to argue for with this notion of ubiquitous healthcare is that how can you design everything i mean you even had gaming in yeah. there as a as a thing so so uh uh the, you know the idea of designing gaming like pokemon go i think there were studies that demonstrated how people actually were walking more as a result of yeah. that that particular gaming activity right so so that you know again almost the virtual world and the physical world is intersect in, you know, there's an intersection between those things, right? So, um, so yeah, absolutely. I agree entirely with Dr. Wong. So uh, that we have to really think about every dimension uh, of health. I mean, objects uh, in the household uh, that you talk about that enable someone to age in place as opposed to uh, pro provide risks for people uh, for falling or, 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 or whatever, or navigation. Um, the idea of, of, again, walkable communities. Uh, so um, that, you know, one of the things about COVID is you see people walking. <laughs> you see people out, uh, you know, walking their dogs. They're out on the streets more uh, because they just need that escape from that home environment. The same thing goes for how we design our environments, right? Everything from the homes to the restaurants to the places that were originally designed to not necessarily think about health in a, in a broader way. I mean, our restaurants have poor ventilation. Uh, you know, the fact that people are now eating and out and dining out. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? when the weather turns really cold. Now, uh, those of you in Canada, that's gonna come sooner than for us down here in South Carolina in the United States. Uh, but um, you know, how will we support those kind of activities that are important social activities? I think everybody is getting uh, uh, you know, really stressed out by being so confined at this point in time, but how can we design our environment in a way that enables us to exist in the social world in a healthy way when we've got these issues of uh, social distancing, uh, sheltering in place? Uh, you know, how can we do those kind of things? Uh, that, I mean, if we can solve that problem, and the big question that, that I think we will we will be faced with post-COVID is, 
is how do we deal with the public realm? How do we deal with those public spaces? How do we deal with the workplace? Uh, you know, you know, the, the speculation is, is that more and more people are going to continue to work from home. Uh, and, and so now the home environment becomes even more important uh, because we're going to be spending so much more time there. Uh, and um, uh, so, you know, those kind of places, those, those places in, in, in our cultures that, 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 that support the everyday acts of life uh, that are going to be really important to figure out how we can adapt those and adapt to those in ways that allow us to continue to live as normal a life as possible given a variety of situations and conditions. And I fully agree with Professor Allison. I just want to say that many of the things that we have seen so far during the COVID-19 pandemic, I think they're here to stay. I think the pandemic has really catalyzed that paradigm shift that would have taken a much longer time to result in the things that we're seeing. So a lot of the things that we're seeing, the, the adjustments, the adaptations are likely going to be part of the new norm. And therefore, how can we use design to enable us to live through the new norm in a, in a more interesting in a less painful way. I think that's one way of putting it. Now, obviously in doing so, we have to make sure that we continue to protect the communities, including those who are most vulnerable. And that is why earlier on, I spoke about some of those social determinants of health, because whether it is about spaces or about devices or about any other objects, access to those things are not necessarily the same around the world or even within a particular jurisdiction. So oh, I think we really need to start thinking in terms of those important principles as drivers for the design. So, you know, it, it is, the, I think, um, in, in, in health, in medicine, and I'm sure in architecture, we always talk about the importance of functionality and form follows function. And I think it is not as simple as form following function, but form and function intersects. Mm -hmm. They intersect in new ways that are now almost beyond our imagination before COVID-19. So how do we learn from those intersects and move things forward? I think that's the big challenge. Yeah, and I think it's also redefining function, the idea of if function is just not a matter of, of, of productivity or time and motion, that function is, 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 has a qualitative dimension to it, that, that uh, the quality of life is an important part of that, right? So, um, so I think that was the big misconception with form follows function of the modernist, right? The, the, that it got interpreted as this very narrow definition uh, of, of what that meant. And so, you know, if you go back to, let's say, Le Corbusier and some of his ideas uh, uh, about urban design, uh, the reality was they were almost all public health ideas. They were coming out of the, the Victorian area, industrial cities, that were, that were sick, that were unhealthy, the air was polluted, the water was polluted, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the streets were, were, were basically sewage uh, uh, traps. So, um, so, you know, they were public health ideas. And the reality is the determinants of health that Dr. Wong talked about, you know, there's lots of studies that say your zip code is a greater indicator of your health status than almost anything else. So, and when we talk about at-risk populations for situations like this pandemic, you know, when you live in a community where the prevalence of asthma is 10 times higher than in, in, a, in an adjoining zip code or something like that, then those people are, are increasingly at risk for, uh, for complications as a result of situations like COVID. So, so it's environmental health is a big part of what we're talking about. So, you know, we like to think about dealing with health at the levels of individuals, at the levels of community, 
and at the level of the global environment, uh, and, and, and that everything that we do should be, uh, you know, uh, geared towards that. And even down to the issue of wearables. I mean, we're in disposable to society right now. So, you know, uh, how do I recycle the products, uh, the cradle to cradle kind of notion of that everything goes back in either to biological waste or technological waste and can be recycled in one way or another. So, I th you know, I think we just have to think very broadly uh, across all those dimensions. Absolutely. And since we're talking about the vulnerables, I just want to share again as a geriatrician, uh, working with seniors, um, you know, we, we certainly need to be very mindful in terms of using design to uh, protecting and supporting um, the most vulnerable in our community. And we have to remember that these designs do not necessarily have to differ for these groups than for the general population. What I often talk about is what is good medicine or health for seniors is good medicine or health for everybody. So I think that's really an important concept that we do not necessarily carve out some kind of very specific design. Now, notwithstanding, the needs might be different. And again, you know, I totally agree with the notion that we need to really be mindful as we're designing things. One example that I want to talk a little bit about, and that certainly has raised a lot of attention since COVID-19 has started, will be individuals who are living with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Now we know that uh, the number of individuals living with Alzheimer's disease and other related dementia has been increasing in the world even before COVID. And one of the things that we have recognized is those who live with Alzheimer's disease, for example, have faced a double burden, a double burden in terms of COVID-19 and its impact. Not only are their social constructs disrupted, because of physical distancing and therefore the risk of social isolation and loneliness. There is also now emerging evidence and data that suggests that individuals with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, actually are more likely to die from COVID-19 if they actually have the disease. So this is one example whereby, you know, I would be very curious in asking a question, how can we use design of whatever, you know, whether it is about space, whether it is about devices, whether it is about household objects, to really protect and supporting these very vulnerable individuals who typically are relatively voiceless and don't have a very strong advocate for them. So this is one example. It doesn't kind of stop there, but I just want to flag it because I think there are unique opportunities right now that have been revealed by COVID-19 that really can get us thinking. Right. So yeah, we've, we've really got to like hear so many like um, detailed principles and ideas how we should kind of really look at this healthcare, how it should be something not just um, uh, almost like just not a bottom up thing, but almost like a no, not like top down thing, but more like a bottom up thing. Like it starts from the everyday lives, and then it it really become something that it's almost like preventive that it's um, within everyone's life rather than something that's just defensive in towards the end. And on that note, we're thinking like, um, so as, as jurors, because we've talked about so many like uh, ideas that you're interested in, what would you be looking at the most when you are evaluating um, a competition entry for this, for this competition, for example? Like what, how much about like the creativity or how much about the feasibility side of things? And, and this question applies to David as well. Okay. Well, do you want me to start with that one? Uh, so, I mean, I look at competitions as, 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 as sparks that maybe start uh, 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 a fire of an idea. So uh, the, the the practicality is maybe something that can be worked out in the longer term kind of uh, study of a of a given proposal or, or project, right? So I think it needs to be believable, maybe. But I'm more interested in a compelling idea that's clearly and succinctly communicated 
uh, I mean, and that is rigorously developed both in terms of the process and the product, right? So, so that, you know, you're, a competition is almost like, first of all, foremost in the first pass, uh, having been on numerous juries, I mean, it's almost like the elevator pitch. You've got to get the idea across very quickly, very clearly, uh, you know, for those of us who are architects visually uh, uh, and very effectively, right? And then once you've grabbed someone's attention in that first pass of a competition, then you need to be able to, to give them enough information to understand the depth of the of the proposal uh, and the and the and the viability of the proposal, but I I, I think competitions are a place for speculation, uh, and uh, and so you know I think uh, you know that that's one of the things I'm I'm really looking for is someone to think out of the box, not necessarily have all the nuts and bolts figured out of how it how it will actually work. And from my point of view, as a medical scientist and a clinical researcher, um, the lens that I always apply to in any kind of competition, including this particular one, really is the potential impact that the work may have on the audience that is targeted for. And I think um, we don't expect, you know, in a competition like this, a fully fleshed out results and impact analysis, but it has to contain the nuggets. The nuggets could suggest there likely is going to be an impact. I mean, let me give you one example. I'm looking at our very beautiful backdrop that uh, the competition has designed, and I, I'm actually quite uh, impressed with the fact that toilet paper is included uh, in, in this particular design. Uh, I would love to hear a project, for example, that somehow can demonstrate the impact of toilet paper in something that we're going through. I use this as an example because, um, you know, we know that during the early times anyways of COVID-19, in many jurisdictions around the world, people have been really bulk purchasing, Boarding. shall I say, mm -hmm. a, a number of items, including toilet paper. And as a, a clinician, it always occurs to me, why on earth would they stockpile on toilet paper when there might not be enough food supply um, yeah. you know, to use the toilet paper for, just to put it bluntly. Um, but, but that said, uh, what I'm trying to say is something as benign looking as toilet paper, if you can demonstrate what potential impact this design of the newly redesigned toilet paper can be, uh, I, I certainly would be very interested. So I think the one word I'm looking for is impact or at least the potential of yeah. an impact. No, that's a good, that's a good one. Significance would be another, uh, another uh, word to maybe associate with that. No, that's great. But uh, yeah, I, actually, so when we really um, have this list of physical so-called physical spaces, as well as an object. We are really thinking of different spectrum of spaces, like things from like really small daily objects, like uh, toilet paper and like things, right. to kind of like medium architectural size spaces, almost like a room, right. to something that's very urbanized, to something like um, public spaces and public plazas, and even like public infrastructure, such as um, the parking space. Right. We, we, we we're thinking like, uh, this is a way to kind of like really do this competition. We really want to engage not maybe just not only architects because we also write designers within this um, comp like as part of the invitations to potential uh, participants. So not just only the um, discipline of architecture, but we really want to engage people from all different kinds of fields to kind of like uh, come together to how our daily lives. Uh, this daily everyday spaces can be really real cause of um, health and wellness. Mm. Yeah, so I guess like it's almost amazing that like today's discussion is almost entirely something that we are looking for. So what we really want, what really this competition want to express to look at uh, healthcare not only from a very 
um, specialized lens. Because like, to be honest, most of us are not really trained in the medical field. And a lot of us like designers and architects, we, we, to us, like health is part of our daily life, but because we don't really, we, we have the misconception, like if we want to kind of like deal with the kind of like a uh, medical or health designs, we have to be somehow um, a professional or like have certain ex expertise on it. So it's a really good opportunity to kind of think how as architects or designers, us, especially just non-medically specialized um, people can really contribute to create a picture of health. So not just relying on how, how like our maybe detailed designs, the space, to such as maybe just the flooring to make it less slippery can really kind of like um, contribute to the overall kind of like uh, how we can um, really uh, promote the idea of this health from an approach where everyone participates in it. Everyone has uh, a responsibility in terms of the overall wellness and the health of the community and even like the, the global population. Right. And maybe I'll add a little bit if I may. I think uh, we're talking about using design and architecture as enablers mm -hmm. to empower people to pursue health. And let's not forget that another very important enabler is education. You can have the best designs in right. the world, but if you don't educate people how to use them properly, as David and I have been talking about so far today, I, th I think that's not going to realize the full impact of that design or that space. So I, another thought is, you know, I really like to use the word intersectionality because things intersect. So the question really is how will design and architecture intersect with education? Now we know that education is now delivered as a result of COVID-19 in a new way. And many of us, um, you know, as a medical educator, we see this again as part of the new norm. This is actually going to be going forward, whether it is using online delivery, blended delivery with in-person instruction that could be done in a safe way, the use of simulation technology, these things. But how do you generalize these methodologies? How do you generalize these things that are embedded within design and, and architecture that the general public, the lay person can have access to? I think that is a big question. So you can talk about you know, having a, a wonderful watch or bracelet or necklace, but how do you incorporate some kind of an education component through active engagement for people? It's not a small issue. It's something that many of us have been really scratching our head for the last little while. Because if you look around the world during COVID-19, I think many of us will look at practices um, that are seen in particular parts of the world in saying, geez, why did that happen? And then immediately we think about the importance of education. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Actually, you brought up a very good point because um, one of our audience also have a question related in with regard to um, education because we all know that collective wellness really depends on collective effort, right? So the public in itself is such, is perhaps it's the biggest contributor to our um, wellness environment rather than just a couple of designers or architects. So in light of anti-mask protests that we know in different countries, we know that the public might not always be aware of what is perhaps a, the best way to, to promote collective wellness. Um, I'm just uh, out of curiosity because you are a frontline so medical worker and a practitioner, and you, of course, come into contact with the public on, on, on a daily basis. Uh, what would you think would be, what, what do you think would be an approachable way for the public to receive information like that? Because as designers, I think that would be very valuable for us to know, how can we reach the public in a more effective manner? I think the one word answer is has to be a multi-pronged approach. Now the problem there is what are the prongs? What are the facets? 
And that depends on your target audience. And we know that around the world, there are now individuals, um, you know, in, in, in age groups um, who are, you know, during the current newer wave, second wave and third wave of the pandemic, we know that in many parts of the world, uh, the younger population, age 20 to 39, uh, the number of positive cases in those kind of age groups have been going up. Um, even though thankfully um, the, the mortality or the death rate um, has, been go has remained quite low. But the, the risk of the spread of the virus from younger populations, for example, to those loved ones, their loved ones who are, might be more vulnerable they may have long-standing health conditions, they may be seniors or whatever, and the risk is really high. So the question really is, how do you get the message across? Now, we know the answer is you have to do it using multiple ways, but many people around the world, our public health colleagues, have been really trying very hard to get the messages across. I think we have an opportunity in design and architecture because we know that um, some of these um, grouping, you know, in particular, we're talking about uh, our, our youth population, our younger population, they are very much um, uh, uh, involved in terms of accepting the early adopters, in, in, you know, to use a language, in new designs, innovations, and so on. So how do we build in some of those educational components as part of the design? maybe not necessarily in a very explicit way, but it, it could be more implicit. Rather than saying, thou shall do this, this, and this, which does not work very well, is how do we incorporate those kind of concepts within kind of our efforts of redesigning the world? Essentially, let's put it this way, we are in the process of redesigning many things in the world. So I, I think that really is the challenge for us. Thank you very much, Roger. David, do you have anything to add in this? Well, and I think, question? you know, from a design standpoint, designers and architects, you know, the great fallacy that the mid 20th century architectural community had was the thought that you could make, you could make people do things with architecture. Okay. so. Um, so, you know, the reality, the role that the designed environment plays is either providing incentives for, for uh, behaviors or disincentives for behaviors, right? So, uh, so what we want to do in the design of the environment is provide incentives for healthy behaviors uh, and that it's are rewarding, it's easier, it takes less time, it, 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 it's less expensive, it's whatever the incentive may be that makes life better, easier, uh, with less stress, you know, if we can provide ways to design things that provide those incentives and, or that make things more challenging if they're, if they're unhealthy. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have this kind of, you know, so you were talking to Dr. Wong was talking about the young population and the desire. So I live in a college town. So there's this desire to socialize outside of the campus. <laughs> so how do you create the social space that, that allows for a healthy social socialization as opposed to, and those opportunities for that? Uh, I mean, I saw this, this bar in Maryland, I think, that had these tables that people got into the middle of the table and it, and it made a six foot sphere around them so that they couldn't get closer to the next person than six feet. Um, and yet they could still be in a bar, <laughs> an outdoor bar. Uh, so, you know, um, so, you know, those are the kinds of things and it made it fun, right? So it was, a, it was, it was, it was, it, there was, there was incentives to, to do it because it was fun. It was, dis it was unique. It was distinctive. So how can we provide incentives? Everything from the incentives to use a device effectively or, or not to a space uh, appropriately to, again, you know, walking as a health giving activity, right? So how do we incentivize walking? We could de disincentivize it by not providing communities that are, that are connected, that by not providing sidewalks by, uh, that are adequate with uh, or safe uh, pathways. Uh, so, 
So then do we you know, design the world to provide incentives to, to make it easier to walk, to make it safer to walk, uh, to make it more convenient to walk, um, uh, as opposed to getting in our cars or our elevators? I mean, I think one of the great challenges that COVID is going to present to us and the concerns I have is, is public transportation, which is one of the things that you, you identified. So how do you design public transportation to be safe and and, uh, and and accommodate that. You know, we've, there's been great discussion about autonomous vehicles and that eventually we won't have our own individual vehicles and there'll be autonomous vehicles that will drive us around and, and come and pick us up and they'll be delivering packages when they're not moving people around. But how do we design those kind of things so that people are confident that the person that got in it before them uh, <laughs> Is, 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 you know, their the risk is low of, of picking up something, right? Or how, does, how do we take a bus or, or, or a, 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 a tram or, or a train uh, or an airplane uh, in a way that is safe uh, uh, and, 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 and doesn't compromise our health, that doesn't provide risk for us? Uh, so... So how we design transit is, is going to be a big challenge, uh, I think, uh, because we know that public transit is a, a healthier activity. It promotes walking. It, 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 it's, it improves the health of the environment by lower carbon footprints. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's going to be one of the big challenges of, of, of this post-COVID area, how we deal with and bring confidence back in using public transportation people and i want to add uh, if i may add quickly no. to what uh, uh david has said because i think one point that is really important is the very last bit in terms of the building that confidence because again this is an example whereby uh in the design process you know not only do we have to uh, kind of engage real users so that we get the user experience aspect and incorporate them into the design but there is going to be some dovetailing, again, coming back to that education component. So while the design itself is not that education component, there has to be a package. And how do you put that together? And the education cannot be very prescriptive. Mm -hmm. It has to, and I, I, I really like um, uh, the uh, concept of trying to empower people. So if your design can be used to empower people, at least they feel empowered. You know, it's, it's a subjective sensation. It's not, you know, because what is empowering to one person may not be so for another person. Let's put mm -hmm. it this way. So, you know, if, if a person feels that strong sense of empowerment, then they will proceed and pursue that particular activity. And you need them to pursue that new or redesigned activity enough times that they have that confidence back. And I think this, this is a really important point when it comes to um, any kind of public entities, whether it is transportation, uh, congregate housing. I mean, that's another really sticky point post COVID, which is already happening right now. People are asking the questions, how do we redesign spaces for congregate housing? whether it is a university dormitory or whether it is a long-term care home, et cetera. Thank you. Just one last question, and it's kind of interesting. One of the um, participants asked, like, given the Duro's extensive knowledge, or like, um, basically, one step. Like proves to be proves to have a lot of like potential. Um, what are the potentials? Like, what are the, how, how willing are our jurors to kind of like continue to work with maybe selected candidates to kind of really push forward the architecture? Because both of you saying like, um, you at first you're just looking for some ideas that might be might be more conceptual an idea because it's it's a competition. But after the competition, are there possibilities to really um, help? Some of the participants to really push their architectural proposals into a more viable project that might be useful for like uh, any of the researches or any of the uh, uh, applications in basically uh, 
in the actual uh, healthcare or like just health related like uh, areas, right? Sure. Well, one of the things is the organizers of this you might think about mm -hmm. doing uh, is the equivalent of of, of uh, pinups or or reviews mm -hmm. uh, that are in the public domain that that you bring your uh, the jurors and the and the and, and and those of us who are doing these chats together, and we can we can you know provide feedback in a in an open and transparent way. Uh, and I'd be happy to, to to participate in that process uh, later on. So you know that might be something. So not you know the problem is a competition it ends and then right, someone gets yeah. a prize and then you know, they're on their own to figure out what to do with it after that. So maybe you you think about continuing this effort uh, after that after that process. Yeah. I, th I think David has a very good point, and I think that uh, certainly is uh, uh, certainly one approach. Um, I think one of the things that we know is typically after competitions um, of this nature, uh, the, the, then the real work begins. Yes. <laughs> and 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 I think if therefore the organizers want to think about. Uh, a, a conduit to receiving a consultative advice from mm -hmm. the jurors and the speakers in a chess series as, as what yes. David has provided uh, as a suggestion. I think that is a, a good way to pursue Right, thank you. Yeah, because like what we're thinking is, is that the purpose of the competition really is not just only to uh, give a prize, but it's really trying to kind of like um, open up the discussion about health. And certainly, like, if the participants can get some further advice on how to really land their projects, or if there are actually future possibilities or avenues that their projects could be physicalized or pushed further, that I think that would be really uh, valuable to the participants. And also, I think maybe those kind of like um, review sessions will be a better way for our jurors to understand their projects better because it will be uh, more like a two-way communication rather than just looking at their like presentation boards and maybe get more in-depth knowledge about some of their projects and more insights. Yep. And on that note, I think we really thank our two jurors as uh, speakers for today. And we really, like through our one hour of like this conversation, We've really learned a lot of insights into this health. We really opened up the discussion of the healthcare into the realm of like health promotion. And also we've gotten a lot of like new perspectives and ideas from both of our speakers. And I really thank you, Dr. Wong and David for your contribution for today. And we hope everyone else can enjoy. So the uh, recordings of the videos we posted online and we will also have um, updates of this uh, conversation in all subsequent Instagram posts. Yeah. So that'll be it for tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank and we you look forward to following the Thank developments of the, of, the, of the effort. So thank you. Thank you. We'll definitely keep you well updated. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good weekend.